Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby, Season 3. Hello and welcome to this week's House of Rugby. We would normally have Sean O'Brien, but he has headed back to Ireland and is using the excuse that he doesn't have any internet over there at all. Sounds doubtful, but we said goodbye to him last week and then here he is proving that you can't have too much of a good thing. Alex is back. And Alex, we're doing a Japan special. You're getting some of your friends on who are over there. Delighted to also have Will Genia along with us. Now, I feel that I want to start something really positive, but you both have something in common in that, sadly, your sides were both knocked out at the weekend. It was um, not a great day for me. Um, <laughs> we we played the probably the best team in the competition. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. It makes me feel a bit better. And we got a bit of a drubbing. Um, not Not helped by... Uh, losing a player after 25 minutes to a red card. And um, yeah, it was a tough day at the office. I made the call about two minutes in when Bowden Barrett scored that we were all going to walk back for the kickoffs um, and take as long as possible. So we sort of stretched <laughs> out. Anytime they scored a try, it was about a minute for them to kick and then about <laughs> another 90 seconds before we kicked off. So that kept the score line down a bit, really. They, I think they did score 11 tries, though, so you might have wanted to walk slightly slower. <laughs> that's impossible it would it was awkward <laughs> enough at the speed i was demanding our team walk back um so yeah i mean look going into it you know they put 94 points on a team the week before and so 79 points to 31 you know we scored 30 points i'm, I'm happy with that now will we hear a lot about um alex's stories and adventures in japan and his sort of Slightly disappointing results. Um, in terms of your Japan experience, you've been out there a couple of years now. Um, how much do you enjoy that, even though that you're also outside the competi- out of the competition now? Yeah, look, I've really enjoyed my, my time here. I mean, um, you know, you, you c- coming from playing test rugby and, and, and super rugby for a number of years, you, you sort of don't have much time off to, um, you know, rest or rest your body or go away and do other things. You know, being over in Japan, I've been here for two years and we played 14 games. So there's been, there's been a whole lot of time off, which has been quite enjoyable to spend time at home with family and friends and things like that. But um, yeah, look, I've really enjoyed it. Unfortunately, over the weekend, similar experience to uh, um, Alex there, we had 54 points put on us in the second half, I think, which was pretty gutting. But um, we're probably different in a sense that we've come up from Division 2. So we, we've probably we've been handing out the hidings down in Division 2 when we finally got the taste of our own medicine on the weekend. Yeah, I said that you've been out there a couple of years. So would you want to continue rugby out in Japan, Will? Or do you fancy trying your chances somewhere else? Because you, you have played Super Rugby, you've played all over. Um, is it something that you've thought about continuing your travels? I love it over here. Like, it's, it's been really enjoyable. The people, the culture. Yeah, the rugby is a little bit different. But uh, I guess from where I've come from, it's sort of the experience that I was, was after, you know. Ideally, for me, I'd like to stay. I'd like to stay another year or maybe two years. And um who you knows, maybe try to continue that adventure later on in the States. Obviously, you've played in, in Paris, obviously Super, in Japan. Apart from sort of the, the having less games, how does it compare, really? Well, I think the well, so, I think Super Rugby for me was like the total package, right? You've got physicality, you've got intensity, uh, you've got the speed of the game and, and very high level of skill. When I think about um, my time in the, in the top 14, it's probably more around the physicality of the game. It wasn't as fast. Uh, more around playing percentages, kick the corners, take your points, set piece. But when you come here, like it's, if I'm being honest, the, phys- the level of physicality is is sort of nowhere near those two competitions. But it's still quite a fast-paced game. Um, I think some a lot of the guys here play with a good level of skill, but because you don't have that level of physicality, you, you, the, the speed of the game probably picks up a little bit, which which has been a bit of a change. But it's been an enjoyable one, I think. And, and next season, do you know what league you'll be in? Are you Division 2? Are you in the top league? Mate, it's all, sort of all up in the air. I think at this stage they think we'll be um, uh, in Division 1. But I think the way the competition is going to work next year is um, all clubs will become professional sporting sort of franchises. Um, and it'll be, yeah, the, the top 12 in the country. So, I mean, at this stage, I think we, we are top 12, but they haven't announced what it's going to look like. Um, exactly as yet. Your pre-match meal, is it the same as me? Is it um, a white sandwich <laughs> with maybe some strawberries in it, a chocolate milk or something like that? Do you, do you tell me you have something different, please. Mate, they have chicken and pasta and um, miso soup, I think, for breakfast when we're playing at 12. So that, that 
that I don't vibe with that. I think I just have like toast just to just to keep it simple. Nice. <laughs> Well, in terms of the the quality of rugby in Japan, we see this massive influx of players from all around the world now. Um, but it's also, you know, when you when you see them playing, when you read the articles, everybody's talking about um, the actual the quality of the Japanese players being improved by this influx of players as well. You know, how far are Japan from being allowed to have a couple of teams, for example, in Super Rugby, or, or what more needs to happen for that quality of rugby to keep improving? It's more a case of how you say structure the the Southern Hemisphere provincial competitions. Like at the moment, you could say as constructed teams like um, uh, Suntory and, and maybe Corbett, for example, with players like Bl- Brody Italic and Ben Smith. You'd say that you could probably put them in the Super Rugby competition, and they'd they go all right. You know, they they'd, they'd certainly beat a, uh, a few of the teams. But I'm not sure how that actually works because a lot of those players, those foreign players that are over here at the moment, are actually only here on sabbaticals, and we'll head back to the, um, we'll head back to obviously their provinces in in New Zealand and Australia. So I think at this stage, you probably give it another couple of years where the influx of foreign players works to improve the level and the standard and the expectations. Because yeah. I think the biggest thing I've found is. It's tra- the, the way that they train is, is probably the biggest area that you need to change. Little habits around consistency um, of performance at an elite level in and around the training paddock, which then will transfer onto the field. I think that's the biggest thing I've found at my club. I totally agree. Um, the consistency of training. So, you know, what you see in the week is what you get at the weekend. And they can't, at my club, it hasn't really ever been pushed. So, you know, people drop balls or throw passes into touch um, and it's sort of laughed off. And you're like, well, no, that's going to happen at the weekend. You know, people just slice a kick and they and they laugh about it. And you're like, if we don't come down these like now and start getting better and improving, then this will just happen all year. And I think that kind of professional attitude of someone going, right, no, this isn't good enough. You know, go and work on your passing, or you know, make sure we get it right, or you know, make sure your details right, is is a big learning curve. And the best clubs do that really well. Um, you know, and and I think on your point about coming into super rugby at the moment most of the clubs have about 50 players you know it's ridiculous like Mm -hmm. Suntory have 55 we have 48 and there's no second tier competition so it's just the guys who play and maybe that's seven games 10 games in a year and there's 20 guys who don't even get a look in don't even get on the field and and so how can they develop that sort of the the player base if it's only a a small amount of people are actually playing and I think that's a big thing to look at having a second tier competition like a second team or a development team just to get them playing rugby but that's a really interesting one because like we, we had a bloke a halfback who'd been here for four years um i didn't play on the weekend because i was injured he in four years that was his first game and we've got a number of guys mm. like that who train who accompany players and workers that play they'll play maybe training games or not even that you're right like there's no way to actually really develop um from a plan perspective, because they just don't get enough games. And to get into Super Rugby, I think you'd have to pull the talent. You could maybe get a Kobe, a Panasonic, a Suntory, and get them pick out some of the best players and put them into those squads, maybe. But other, otherwise, at the moment, there's probably it probably just there's too much talent spread across the teams because then you've got Kobo to have a couple of good players and um, Toyo to have good players, you know, and it's just too spread out because mm. there's 20 teams. You know, you end up with a, you need a sort of uh, Jaguaris type type thing, don't you? Yeah, I think it's an interesting one because say we, I mean, we had the Sunwolves. I don't think that worked because that was kind of a, like a ragtag team put together. And you don't actually have a supporter base or a fan base. Whereas say, like you said, maybe you pull the players into just two teams, whether it's Suntory and Corbett, let's just say. You, you automatically have a fan base who are passionate about the game. We'll, they'll fill out stadiums and things like that. But they also have programs put in place around how they want to play the game, the game style, as opposed to starting from scratch. Yeah, and actually last week uh, we had Namani Nadolo on and he was talking about the introduction of the, the Pacific Island sides and, and what they're going to have to do um, to improve in, in um, Super Rugby or when they first get into Super Rugby. It's just a really interesting time, isn't it, for for, for rugby on the whole. Um, let's talk about the Will Australian Rugby. Um, as a nation, um, there was this conversation that, you know, there, there wasn't the following in Australia, that rugby union in Australia was on a downward turn. Um, what is the situation from your experience, your knowledge at the moment? Well, I think in Australia, it's such a huge uh, sporting landscape. There's so many, there's such high competition for, you know, primetime viewing and, and, and participation from kids 
girls, boys growing up to play any sport. You know, rugby league, you'd say, and AFL and cricket would be the, the probably the dominant three, then maybe even football. Um, but the thing that rugby was doing that was shooting themselves in the foot was we weren't free to air. So it was hard to access um, actually viewing the game. So I think that having changed that uh, to free to air coverage now in Australia has made a big difference because it's just opened up to so many more people. Now, not, every, not everybody can afford, um, you know, Foxtel or pay TV. So I think that's up. But also I think the brand of rugby that, um, the team's play makes a big difference. I think if you look at the team at the Queensland Reds who play quite an expansive style of rugby that's attractive to watch, it's entertaining. That That's certainly something that you know draws fans to the game and generates interest from kids coming wanting, wanting to come watch but also wanting to be involved in the game. Um, and I think it's heading in the right direction. I really do. I mean, I was there for a while where you know attendances were down and things like that. So to see it sort of moving in that right direction is pretty... And it's pretty satisfying. It's a pretty good thing for the game on whole in the country. And you don't think there's any issues at the moment in terms of how many players are over in Japan? Because every time I play a team, there's always, you know, a couple of Aussies there. And not just the the, the top players, but, you know, guys who may have a chance at test football or on the edge of test football as well. Yeah, I think that's definitely something that's of concern. But I think it's more a reflection of, say, the younger generation. They 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 want to experience travel. They want to experience different things. and. Um, you know, obviously money plays a big factor as well. If you can get paid double the amount to be in Japan playing footy, that's probably not as taxing on your body. A lot of people would do that. So you can sort of relate that to everyday life or corporate work or whatever it is. So I think that, uh, but I think, I, I really think that the rules will change. I know in Australia it's, it's quite strict and that you have to be playing in the country. But <laughs> if you look across, we're talking specifically about Japan, you've got Samu Karevi here, Sean McMahon, um, you know, Isaac Lucas, all players who are certainly, in my opinion, players of na- national interest who, who have the potential to be playing for the Wallabies. And in the case of Samu and Sean, you know, in my opinion, world-class players. So at some point, something's going to have to give. I probably see it being the relaxing of the law as opposed to, um, you know, those players coming back because financially it's you'd be silly to, you know, like I said, if you're getting paid two to three times the amount of money to come over here, so you can set your you set yourself up for life and your family. You, you're more than likely going to make that decision to to come. And I totally agree. I think that Sean McMahon and Karevi are unbelievably world class. As two guys that bashed me up at the weekend, <laughs> best players in the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you talk about um, a lot of the young players coming through from Australia. I just want to um, speak to you about Israel Falau, somebody who you played alongside. Um, for many years, um, at the time when he made his comments on social media, you were um, quite outspoken about it. Um, there was also, I think, a, a hint of sadness because what it actually led to was that Rugby Union lost an incredibly talented player. Um, do you think we'd ever see him coming back to Rugby Union or is, is the, are those bridges burned? I'd love to see him come back. He, I think he's trying to get back into rugby league in the NRL at the moment. I think that's proved to be a pretty difficult um, process because of obviously everything that happened. But yeah, I, like I was incredibly sad because like, what, one of the best players I've played with, if not in the top two, top three, um, unbelievably gifted. One of those players who you went out on the field knowing that you were going to be all right because he was just, he was just that good. Um, and obviously it came at a pretty disappointing time around the World Cup because he would have made such a huge difference for us. I certainly didn't agree with what he said. W- without a doubt, I did not agree with what he said. Um, you can't be you can't be sort of... I guess the argument is all he was doing was quoting what the Bible said, but if you believe in that, you don't necessarily have to push that belief onto other people. Do you know what I mean? So I, I, I still f- firmly stand by that. But what I do also believe is, I guess if he's if he's... If he's, I wouldn't say remorseful, if he's sort of learnt about um, the power and the presence that he has on social media and the effect it has on people, if he's learned and understands that, I'd love for the game to welcome him back with open arms or even rugby league because we get, it, life's about second chances, third chances, fourth, fourth, you know, fourth chances. And I think he's, he's such an incredible talent. But more than that, if you actually meet the guy, he's, he's, he's such a nice guy. He's such a genuine guy. He... He came across as hate um, on his social media posts, but you, you never ever get any sense of that um, of, of hate or anything bad from him because he's just such a genuinely good guy. And 
I'd love to see him come back because I think he's one of the best players that we've had ever in the game. Let's talk about scrum halves. Uh, who is um, catching your attention worldwide just now? Who do you look at um, and think, yeah, okay, he's got it? There's always one name that comes out first, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, DuPont. He reminds me a lot of Faf de Klerk. I think they're very similar players in the sense that it's 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 about their physical presence. They're, they play with a bit of brutality, which is not really what you associate with halfback. Runs incredible support lines. Uh, and you just always notice him on the field. He's been he's been world class the last couple of years, and he's been a joy to watch. I, I'm a bit I'm a bit old school though. I'm a big huge Aaron Smith fan, I, and I'm, one of my favourite halfbacks of all time would, is Ben Young. So I, I, he, he's, I, I those those would be my two favourite. Um, but obviously, you know, Dupont's been he's, he's been unbelievable the last the last two years. Just just on the sort of French scrum half. So obviously, you played in France. We, we briefly mentioned that in France. Obviously, the nine is just the controller, the key player, and just does everything for them. Do you, do you really notice a difference when you're playing out in France against those kind of nines compared to the rest of the world? Yeah, definitely. They they, they, they control the momentum, the tempo of the game. They. they I think they were, they were the first type of halfbacks that you would consider playmaking halfbacks. And I think in years gone by, a halfback's role was essentially get to the breakdown and pass, 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 and occasionally kick. But they sort of tr- trans- transformed the game to a nine who isn't just passing the ball, but controls the game, like I said, through managing the tempo, managing momentum, uh, and, and playing a little bit more off nine as opposed to just playing off 10. And I learned a lot from watching... Um, you know, guys like Morgan Power and players, just halfbacks in um, just those French halfbacks and the way they play the game. And obviously, Aaron Smith, I think, is just his ability to put that pass on the money, you know, every single time. His speed to the breakdown, his thinking. He, he's just a, he's brilliant to watch because he's obviously so small, but yet he can compete in such a physical game. Um, and what he does every week, every year, I think, to try and improve and get better is, is phenomenal. So I, I couldn't agree more on that. He's, 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 to me, he's the best. I mean, like, I actually had a chat with him a couple of, um, maybe about a week ago, we were talking about halfbacks, and we both agreed that we reckon Free Dupree is the, is the GOAT. He's, uh, to me, he's, he's, he's the best ever I've seen. Um, but then around, after, after him, I'd probably, I would pick Smith and, like I said, Ben Youngs, because... To me, they're my type of players. When I think about those three guys as players, that I would, you sort of, I think about them as finesse players. You know, like they, really good skills, really attacking halfbacks. We like to get out and sit defenders down, play people in space, control a game with kicking, running, passing. Um, and I, pro- I, I like that style of play, which is probably why I gravitate a little bit more to those three. But um, it's it's interesting because, like we're talking about Dupont and De Klerk, it's sort of changing a little bit now, where those sort of I don't know how to say it. like just combative halfbacks are more what you, is of what you see and more of what is um, I guess popping on popping out and standing out uh, in the Test match game at the moment. Well, I think uh, Ben Youngs will be hoping that Warren Gatlin's watching this conversation because we're we're in lion's fever over here, and I suppose one of the question marks that a lot of people are talking about when you're everyone's been asked to give their teams and things would be that number nine position. Um, you know when. When we're seeing these lists, everybody seems to have a different idea. Who would you start at nine for the Lions? For me, it depends who you play at 10. I think, say, say I, I would pick Finn Russell at 10 because um, when I think about uh, the team, say, because people talk a lot about the physicality that um, the Springboks will bring, but I think the, the, the Lions will bring just as much physicality, if not more. I think all the Northern Hemisphere teams are very much known for physicality and presence. That, and, and that intensity. And so having said that, I would pick Finn Russell because I think you have a little bit more creativity because I think if you get stuck playing in that slow, um, slow sort of um, percentage type of rugby, you, you play into their hands because they, the, the Springboks like playing that way. They like playing that type of rugby and it suits them perfectly. So if I'm picking Finn Russell at um, 10, which I would, I would probably pick Ben Youngs at nine because then he gives you that control. He gives you that presence of someone who's played 100 tests um, either him or Conor Murray, because then you get a um, someone who gives you a little bit more control while giving a bit more freedom to Finn Russell at ten. Yeah, I think for me, Conor Murray, um, something against Ben. I think Conor Murray's box kicking, his 
physicality around the breakdown. I know we talked about you don't have to meet them physically, but I thought he was um, just outstanding against the All Blacks in uh, when the Lions played there. And I think he could really work with Finn Russell really, really well and uh, certainly give them something to to think about, but also just that control, as you said. And uh, like, I think it will be a phenomenal series. Um, I really do. The fact that you've got <clears throat> so much talent in the Northern Hemisphere, the South Africa haven't played that much. It should be really interesting to see how they go. Um, but they're coming off the back of a World Cup win, so they're pretty confident. The, the interesting one is who would you pick at fullback? I wanted to ask you. It's so, because there's so many good players at the moment. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess I say bias, he's Welsh, but <clears throat> I play with him. Um, I think if Liam Williams is fit, I, I would play him at fullback. Um, I think his aerial game is so good. There's two games at altitude, be a big part of it. Um, and I think he brings an X factor in so many ways. Look, Stuart Hogg has been doing unbelievably well. He had a great Six Nations again for Scotland. Um, but I just think Liam Williams, uh, his aerial ability and then ability to come into line and make things happen uh, is, is first class. Uh, Will, before we uh, let you go, um, just uh, tell us sort of what's next on your agenda then. You're out of the competition in Japan. What do you head back to, to Australia? Yeah, so we're out of the competition. We've got uh, a week here because we've got to hang around for our uh, end of season breakup, which is uh, this coming Sunday. And I think we've got until September off. So I haven't seen my family in nine months because my, my wife and my daughter are in, in Brisbane, obviously, with everything going on with COVID. So I've not seen them in nine months. So I'm really looking forward to getting home and, and spending some time with them. I mean, I've only done six months, uh, but nine months is, is very tough. So I wish you all the best and I bet it's be amazing to see them. It's been a real pleasure, Will. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. No, I appreciate it. Big fan of the show, so I was really, um, really stoked to 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 get the call to, to jump on. So thank you, thank you for having me. Well, the absence of Sean O'Brien means that we're not going to do any other rugby chat. We're not going to find out his opinion on the Lions. We're definitely not going to talk about London Irish this week, but we are going to stick to our Japanese theme because Alex, you have managed to rope in one of your friends. I'm not sure what he's done to deserve this. I'll let you take it away. <laughs> uh, we're very, very lucky to have uh, <laughs> the great man. He's managed to put his top on for the first time in months. Um, <laughs> probably because it's not Instagram, but uh, yeah, the South African superstar, <laughs> Jesse Creel. Good to see you, mate. Goody, um, thank you so much for that very flattering <laughs> um, intro. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a big uh, honor and privilege for me to be on your show today. And um, yeah, really looking forward to having a chat to you guys. Thanks so much, Jesse, for taking the time. Um, you are unusually for this program today in Japan and still in the competition. Is this what I've, <laughs> I've been told? <laughs> yes, uh, we are still in the competition. We um, had a very good win yesterday or the day before, I think. And um, yeah, so we, we live another week. Yeah, Jesse. Yeah, another week. Well, Jesse scored another try. Ran around a few people again, you know. Generally, just he looked a bit, a bit too good, really. But uh, he's got quite a good team, as I found out three weeks ago or four weeks ago when um, they put seventy on us. Um, and about four minutes in, Jesse ran <clears throat> probably about seventy yards, like it was a school game. He just ran straight through and ran around everyone. And there's me flailing, trying to keep up with him. At which point, two days later, he told me, having a beer, he goes, uh, it was a pretty pathetic attempt. I was like, oh, cheers. Cheers, pal. Thanks. Yes. You're quite quick if you didn't know. No, Goody, you're just slow, bud. Yeah, that is true. So thank you. You're, you're a good man. But, uh, the good thanks, thing for, is, thanks for making me look quick. I appreciate well, it. You're a good you know, friend. I am. At that point, it's all about making it look good. But luckily, uh, your modelling career is over now after that, that big cut of yours, eh? It's game over. Yeah, I mean, a uh, bit, bit of a tough cut a few weeks ago. But um, I think your modelling career is just starting after you've cut that goatee off. Uh, so, yeah, thank um, there's, goodness there's, for there's, that. There's hope in this. There's hope that's, in this. That's <laughs> funny because you said at the time I should definitely do it, and you really liked it. So you, you know, you just said that's both before sides. I saw the real true colour of it. Yeah, maybe yeah. that is fair. It was going very ginger, to be fair. Still. The idea um, was good, but the outcome not as good. Yeah, I'll yeah, tell Mackenzie exactly. that. Exactly. Jesse, in terms of the the facial injury, Alex sort of like touched upon it there. When you see the photos of it, it looks brutal. It looked like a shark attack or something. But when you got the facial injury, you then played on. 
Yeah, um, I think we, <laughs> our Japanese coach kind of didn't really give give um, myself a choice. I was in the <laughs> medic room and uh, there was just Japanese blurring through on the radio telling me telling the medic to get me back on the field. So luckily yeah. got a few stitches in and then was was back on and playing. But it's healed now. You can't tell. You can't tell now from the pictures that I saw of it at the time to sitting here now. It doesn't look that bad. Yeah, I think thanks to one of my teammates, uh, Edward Quirk, um, I, I had him next to me with a, with a Japanese doctor and Quirky was telling him to, to put more stitches in because initially there was only like six stitches and Quirky kept on telling him, no, put more, put more. And he's like, no, it's fine now. And he just carried on telling him to put more stitches in. So I'm very grateful that I've got uh, caring teammates. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a bit of a shame that you uh, don't qualify for the like the Japanese do for the the money for the stitches in the face. You could make a, a big big income there. If I had told you the amount that I would have got for this cut, uh, yeah, I probably would have been on holiday already. So, um, <laughs> very disappointing that we don't qualify for that. Let's uh, stick with our uh, theme of injuries. Sadly for you, Jesse, because I want to talk about the Rugby World Cup, not just what it meant for South Africa as a team and as a nation for winning, but also what you had to go through that sort of heartbreak of being out of the campaign so early with that injury. Yes, um, obviously getting the injury so early in the competition was very disappointing for myself. But I mean, um, from a team perspective, I think um, the guys really, we went on to achieve something that really great. And um, and like you've mentioned, it did so much for our country. So I just think being part of the whole um, process leading up to the, to, to the World Cup final, um, I think that was in, in itself just a really special um, achievement for all of us and myself personally as well. And you actually went back out for the final. You got flown back out, didn't you? Yes, I got flown back out for a good party. It was unreal. <laughs> but go, going into it, um, it, it really seemed like watching it from the outside, obviously speaking to uh, some old teammates and Sculpt Brits and stuff, it seemed to be, and he talked a lot about just how close the group was. You know, there seemed to be a real emphasis on the togetherness during that during that tournament. Was it was it something that sort of Razi really put a lot of time into? Um, or is it just something that just happened quite naturally as a group? Um, yeah, I think, Goody, that's a great point. I think Rassi, um, he's an unbelievably intelligent guy. And I think the way he uh, brought the squad together, brought guys like Skulk Brits back into the mix, um, a guy like Franz Stein, um, all these old heads that that really had experience in, in understanding what made a winning team and, and what kind of culture and, and, and relationships that were needed in a championship team. So... I think having guys like that involved in the team, they really um, push the the points of spending time together, spending quality time together away from rugby. And I think that's something um, these days that, that 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 a lot of teams don't get right. And I think it is something at the Springboks that um, that that we got right um, two years ago um, in in terms of spending quality time together away from rugby and 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 forging those those special bonds and relationships that 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 make us so special in the end of the day. Nice. And then going going forward now, obviously, hopefully Cannon, Cannon Eagles, Jesse's team will, will lift the trophy. Um, but after that, you know, there's obviously, has there been some chat with the coaches and the conditioners about the next, well, the next few months or the plan going forward? Um, yes, we have had uh, an, an alignment camp um, with the Japanese base players. So um, it, it all depends on what happens with, with, uh, with us in the, in the Japanese competition. Um, but we are kind of aligned to, to, to the plans of what they want and, and what the next couple of months are looking. So, yeah, that's all exciting. Um, but like I said, obviously, it, nice and focused on what's happening here at the moment. And then when I do end up getting on the flight back to South Africa, I'll kind of just zoom in and, and start focusing on the next kind of step in, in, in that direction. Because, Jesse, it is incredible to think that when you talk about that um, World Cup final, that was the last test match that... South Africa have played collectively and it was a long time ago. So heading into a Lions um, tour, you know, how much of a disadvantage, if at all, do you think that is? Um, I think in a way it, it, it would be, it would be, it is quite tough that we haven't uh, been together and stuff. But I think if you look purely at the performances of the individuals that, that will make up the squad, I think that's a real, real big positive. I think guys mm -hmm. are playing well. If you look at um, uh, Damien de Allende's past performance for Munster this weekend, um, he's been massive for them. So all these guys that are that are kind of involved in the squad are, are really putting up their hands and, and playing quality rugby week in and week out. It's, 
and that's a big part of um, what Rassi and Jock um, they they want from players is to 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 obviously play well on the weekends and and do it on a consistent basis. So um, I think that's a real positive if you if you want to look at the positive um, side of it. And and what are your memories of like Lions tours to South Africa? Because I, everyone in England, you know, I'm older than you. I'm obviously ancient. I think of the '97 uh, Living with the Lions video, and it's the best video ever made. Or you know, it was a video v, v, VHS, is it? For neck, I'm old. Um, <laughs> but um, no, it was just an amazing experience to see behind, sort of in the changing room, behind the scenes, um, and for them to win in '97 was, was massive. And then obviously 2009 was you know a great victory for South Africa so late but it just seems so special to her in South Africa and I'm just interested from your perspective what it's like yeah um obviously in South Africa rugby is is basically a religion um as 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 you guys all know and I think the Lions tour is is, is right up there um right next to the World Cup so I think um if, if personal experience is going back to 2009 I mean that try of Jacques Ferris is probably one of my favorite tries that I ever uh, ever ever witnessed and um i think it also started that kind of dream um for me at going on to to play for the springboks i think that's when i realized flip jock free is um probably one of my biggest heroes ever and uh, ended up getting to train with him and, and play against him actually over here in japan so small little things like that were, were all part of of um getting that that whole rugby dream and and everything kind of um, ignited as a youngster so i think if if i could have any part to play in, 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 in the next kind of lines to it would be, it would be amazing. And hopefully it could spark something in, in someone else in South Africa or in, in some youngster. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking about at the moment. Yeah. Cause Jesse, you could be facing the lines, but you've got a really interesting connection because your great grandfather, John Hodgson actually played for the lions. Yes. Um, I think it's, it's been probably the, the highlight of our, of our, uh, the highlight topic on our, on our family group this, this year. Um, obviously the whole lions tour coming to South Africa and, and my great grandfather that, that, that played there. So, um, it would be really special to be a part of it, but um, there's still a lot of um, water to flow under the bridge before we get there. A lot of hard work that needs to be put in and and um, things that need to go right. So, yeah, I don't want don't to get across that bridge too early. And am I right in saying the cap was just recently returned to the family? Yes, uh, the cap is in South Africa with family. Um, I, I actually, I'm pretty excited to, to see it in first hand. So, um, yeah, really special and a nice... Um, token from from the lines it's uh very nice of them very nice touch from them so who's your family going to be supporting if you're playing jesse <laughs> definitely the spring box uh, not even a question i'm not so sure i man. know you'll also be sporting the spring box goodie so yeah that's a lie come on pal i like you okay <laughs> but i'm firmly behind the lines firmly <laughs> We have gone into Lions fever in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, the squad gets picked next week. Um, who are the sort of outstanding players that you might be facing in the Lions that sort of make you sit up and take notice? Um, yeah, I think if, if I have to look at uh, the same position I play, I'd, I'd, I'd definitely look at guys like Jonathan Davies. Um, he's a really, he's a world-class player, a special player. Um um, Gary Ringrose, I think um, I think he'll be he'll be in and, and around the, the squad. Um, Robbie Henshaw, um, all those kind of guys are, are, are guys that you kind of measure. You want to measure yourself up against every week, and um, that you kind of put the benchmark at to see where you are as a as a player as well. So I think um, I really hope that I will potentially get the opportunity to go play against them. Um, I think we all want to obviously test ourselves against the the best players in the world. And I think those, those, those guys are all up there. Another guy, Henry Slade, um, yeah. quality, quality player, um, Manu Tuilagi. Yeah, I, I can carry on naming the names. Um, uh, there's just quality everywhere. So yeah, it's not a test, um, don't it's, worry. It's a really exciting, really exciting uh, prospect. And Jesse, in terms of um, your future, you're obviously in Japan just now, and I know you're not looking too far ahead, but um, when you sort of see South Africans playing all around the world, it seems that at the moment, Scotland is a South African outpost. There are plenty of South Africans in the Premiership as well. Um, would you ever consider playing your rugby in the Prem? Um, it is definitely something I want to do one day, um, but I really am enjoying my my, my time in Japan at the moment. Um, I'm really enjoying the, the fast pace and the quickness of the game. 
Um, Apart goodie. from Alex. Um, yeah. Yeah, That's um, why he likes it. Really, really enjoying that. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's really it's it's really enjoyable. Yeah, I'm um, getting a lot more touches on the ball and um, getting the ball in my hands a lot more than I would kind of anywhere else. So um, I think I'm I'm quite kind of enjoying that part of the game at the moment and um, yeah, enjoying my rugby. Yeah, we chatted about it. Um, uh, I think a few months ago, and obviously I I must have put him off playing yeah. in the Premiership, <laughs> signed his life away in Japan <laughs> probably. But uh, you know, it's uh, <laughs> no, well, one day maybe. But uh, yeah, as I said, Japan's a, is a wonderful place to play rugby, and you know, Jesse's at a very professional organisation who are doing very well and are only going to get better and better. And Jesse, on that, do you think that since your time in Japan, that th- there's an idea that people go to Japan almost not quite a gap year, but it's mm. not as good a quality as they would be playing in their home country, wherever that may be? Do you think that you have improved as a player whilst you've been over there? Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. I get that question uh, quite a bit, especially from 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 friends and stuff, as they they think it's uh, kind of like uh, club rugby over here, um, or, or, or yeah, the quality isn't that great. But um, I definitely think um, life there's a lot more, a lot less distractions over here. So I think um, you you are kind of more zoomed in on 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 your craft, and I think I do definitely get a lot more time and and make a lot more time to to focus on, on, on skills and improving my game. So I think from that retrospect, I've definitely um, bettered as a player over here. I've definitely become better. Um, I've, learned to, I've learned a lot and um, just learned different things from different styles of, of, of players. I think I've had the opportunity now to play with Australians, Tongans, um, uh, New Zealanders, um, Japanese. So it's, it's, it's interesting to see how different nations see the game and, and what they kind of like um in 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 rugby itself so that's that's been cool and um like i said it's just been good to learn from from different minds and and then apply what i like to my game so it's been cool i think that's the biggest thing is you know having different coaches different players from different countries everyone sees the game differently you know we were talking earlier with Genia about how the, the nines in france play it so differently to the rest of the world and different coaches just do see it in a different way and to have all that knowledge and passed down to you and to learn from different people can only make you a better player. And I would encourage players to travel. And, you know, it took me 14 years at one club before I traveled and it's been the best experience for me. Um, and I think ultimately the more you learn from different areas or cultures and, and different teams, the better you are as a player. Jesse, thanks so much for your time. Um, That is all that we have time for. Next week's House of Rugby will be on the day of the Lions squad announcement. So we we will be reacting to that. There'll be no more lists, no more speculation. We will have a definitive squad for you. Thanks very much for listening, for watching, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. You've been watching the House of Rugby Season 3 on Joe.